Welcome everyone to another edition of WWE Flashback. Last time we were here, we were, re we were chronicling the history of the Royal Rumble. This time around, we'll be chronicling the history of WrestleMania. Okay, so so for the pa next uh, couple weeks, I will be chronicling the history of WrestleMania 1 through 27, plus give my predictions on this year's card. All right, so without anything further, let's go ahead and get started. We'll get started with. WrestleMania 1, since that was the very first show, of course. Anyway, the show kicked off with Tito Santana taking on the Executioner. The Executioner, of course, being Playboy Buddy Rose in a mask. Overall, the match was pretty solid. It was just something to get the crowd going for, for the next couple hours, and it did pretty much did its job. So there's not, not, not much else to say about that. The next matchup was S.D. Jones taking on the master of the five count, King Kong Bundy. Now, there's a lot of speculation to this match because the matchup only lasted about like 24, 25 seconds, but it was only announced as nine seconds for some reason. And I think the reason because of that was because they wanted to push King Kong Bundy as a monster heel, so I guess nine seconds seems more threatening than 25 seconds. But... It did its job. It got Bundy over. Oh, it got Bundy over as a monster heel, and it would set up his biggest feud within the next year. More on that later. The next matchup pitted Matt Bourne, no relation to Evan, taking on Ricky Steamboat. Now Ricky Steamboat had barely made his debut in the WWF, and he was barely off the Jim Crockett Mid Atlantic territory. And it, it, it was pretty much some, again. It was pretty much like the. King Kong Bundy match. This match was just simply to put Ricky Steamboat over as a big time face, and Matt Bourne pretty much did his did his job in doing so. And it was a pretty good match. I not I don't have any big complaints about it. So we'll move on. The next matchup pitted Brutus Beefcake taking on David San Martino. Yes, David San Martino. Yes, he is related to Bruno San Martino, which is his son. This matchup was way too long for me. It was like 11 minutes and 42 seconds. That was way too long. And plus, the matchup was pretty boring. And it seemed, and of course, and it seemed obvious that the only reason why David Star Martino was even there was because of his last name. And of course, that wouldn't be the last time we would see a wrestler's son get pushed because of his last name. Of course, Eric Watts, David Flair. You get, you get the picture. Anyway. Anyway, overall, the match was pointless and boring, and I had no interest in it. The next matchup was the, uh, what was the next matchup? Oh, yes, it was the Intercontinental Champion, it was the Intercontinental Championship match, yes. Forgive me, forgive me, I'm, I'm trying to memorize, I'm trying to memorize this card here. Um, the next matchup was the Intercontinental Championship match between Greg the Hammer Valentine and the Junkyard Dog. Um, dog. No. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, this matchup was okay at best, and the Junkyard Dog is a super over face, he was super over for many years, and rightfully so, he was just such a great character, but this was 1985, and his, his health and his stature as a performer was slowly deteriorating, and you would notice that within the coming years in the WWF, but um, for a championship match, this wasn't I mean, this wasn't much. I mean, this was something that I would see, like, in a house show or something. But, um, for what it was, it was average, and we'll move on. Um, the, ne the next matchup was uh, the WWF Tag Team Championship match between the U.S. Express defending their titles against the Iron Sheik and, uh, and Nikolai Volkov. This, not only was this the second championship match in WrestleMania's history, but um, this was the uh, the first title change in WrestleMania's history as the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov walked away the new tag team champions uh, thanks to the help of Freddy Blassie's Kane knocking out Barry Windham. Um, overall, this match was... Uh, again, this was another average match. Okay, so far... Okay, so far... Okay, so far... The card has been really average. I mean, nothing has really stood out for me. And uh, and before I move on, Tito Santana won his match against the Executioner with a figure four. Uh, King Kong Bundy got over with the Avalanche Splash. Ricky Steamboat defeated Matt Bourne. 
Uh, the the Beefcake and San Martino match ended with the double disqualification. Uh, the Intercontinental title match ended with Greg Valentine being counted out. And of course, the Sheik and, of course, Sheik and Volkov walked out the new champions. I apologize for that. Anyway, we're moving on. We're moving on to the $15,000 body slam match between Andre the Giant and Big John Studd. This was one of the most, one of the first, one of the first memorable moments in WrestleMania's history, as of course people still talk about Andre the Giant body slamming Big John Studd, which he hadn't done so within their feud. Now this is one of the first feuds in the card that had some kind of backstory. All the other matches, I couldn't remember any backstory to that, or it seemed like they were just randomly paired together. And uh, but this one had a backstory, it had a feud, and it had stipulations. If Andre the Giant were to lose, he would have to retire. But if Andre were to be succeed, if Andre were to succeed, he would be fifteen thousand dollars richer. And um, of course, Andre the Giant would win, body slamming Big John Stud. And of course, the moment of Andre grabbing the bag of money, throwing it into the crowd, and Bobby Heenan stealing the money back. Of course, is a moment still talked about to this day. Okay, so now we move on. To, uh, of course, um, again, I apologize. In terms of the match itself, I mean, of course, these two guys are big giants, so I didn't expect anything wrestling-wise. It seemed like the moment of of Andre slamming Big John Stud and the moment of him getting the money was pretty much overshadowed that, and that was all right by me. Okay, so now we move on to the women's championship match between champion Leilani Kai taking on Wendy Richter. And Richter would end up winning the belt, and winning the belt, thus becoming the new women's champion. Okay, overall this matchup was okay at best. Um, I didn't really see anything special. To me, the only thing that overshadowed that was the appearance of Cindy Lauper. Because Cindy Lauper was a huge star at the time, and uh, her appearance, of course, the crowd was really into it. So the crowd level, Cindy Lauper's appearance, pretty much overshadowed the match, which was all right because the match wasn't really that much. So now it's main event time at WrestleMania One, as the main event to WrestleMania One pitted Rowdy Roddy Piper and Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, being accompanied by Cowboy Bob Orton, taking on the team of Hulk Hogan and Mr. T being accompanied by Superfly Jimmy Snuka. Now, of course, to me, this was one of the better matches of the night, of course, because, I mean, first off, you had three of the top stars that the WWF had at the time. Again, and also you had one of the... <coughs> excuse me. Of course, you, and of course you had one of the hottest television stars at the time, Mr. T, thus having boxing legend Mr. T, uh, boxing legend Muhammad Ali and uh, Billy Martin. He had Liberace, and of course, he had all these celebrities here. So, of course, the excitement level was there. The match itself was really, really good. I really enjoyed it. And, um, of course, thanks to a miscalculation on Bob Orton's part hitting Paul Orndorff with the cast, um, it, that would lead to Hulk Hogan and Mr. T walking away the victors and thus leaving the crowd very happy for the very first WrestleMania in the WWE history. Okay, overall, this crowd... Okay, overall, um, to be honest with you, the card was pretty average at best. I mean, it was something... Again, it was, it was something you, you'd probably see out of a house show or something, because most of the matches, except for the $15,000 slam match in the main event, there were no backstories to it. There was no feud, feud whatever. There it, they were just randomly paired together with no story whatsoever back uh, to back it up. But because of the historical significance, the celebrities and the crowd level, I mean, of course I have to give this a good review because this was the very first WrestleMania. I mean, this was the show. This was the show that Vince had everything bet on. He had all of his money. He had everything put on the line for this show. And if it were to fail. And if it were to fail, I mean, that that pretty much be it for Vince. But as history tells us, it didn't fail, and it would get to, and the WWF would continue to sink afloat, to sink afloat for the next few years. 
Alright, so now we move on to WrestleMania 2. In the WrestleMania that was so big it had to be content uh, it had to be held in three venues. It was held at the Nassau Coliseum in New York, the Rosemont Horizon in Chicago, and the LA Sports Arena in Los Angeles. Okay, the show kicked off with Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff taking on the magnificent Don Morocco. And all I gotta say is, whoa. Orndorff has come a long way since WrestleMania 1. Because in the very first WrestleMania, he main evented it. I mean, he was part of the main event. And now, here at WrestleMania 2, he's drinking the curtain. That's a very long way to, to fall. And the match itself was nothing special. It was just punching and kicking, and it ended in a double countout, which didn't really help matters, m m help matters most. It was just something to get the crowd going, and I guess it did. Anyway, we're now moving on to the Intercontinental Championship match between the Macho Man Randy Savage and challenger George the Animal Steel. Now, we all know what caliber of talent that Randy Savage was. He was an amazing talent. Uh, but he had a, such a great personality that can't be matched by anybody. But because he'd only been with the WWF, WWF for a little less than a year, and he barely came from the Memphis territory with his father, Angelo Papo, so he was barely getting the Memphis heel out of his system. And, uh, and you would see a lot of that in this match, as you would see a lot of stalling, not much wrestling. Not much wrestling, a lot of stalling. And plus, working with a guy like George Animal Steel didn't really help the, ma the match make it better. So overall, to me, it ended up pretty much being a disappointment. Of course, Randy Savage would have better matches within the year, and we would see that within the next WrestleMania. More on that later. We now move on to Jake the Snake Roberts taking on George Wells. Now, for those of you asking what in the world is a George Wells... He was nothing more than an enhancement talent. I think he did some kind of work in the CFL, I think. I don't know. But anyway, this was just an enhancement match just to get Jake over as a monster heel, which to me did his job. It was short, but he got Jake Roberts over as a heel. And uh, of course, we would see Jake move on to better thing, move on to better things. More on that later. Okay, the next matchup was the boxing match between Rowdy Roddy Piper and Mr. T. Um, the match ended with uh, Mr. T ending in a disqualification, and I kind of kind of see why they went that way. Of course, they didn't want Mr. T to go over cleanly because there was not and having their monster heel getting, getting a clean loss because Mr. T wasn't going to be around as long as a wrestler, so what was the point? And they, didn't, and they didn't want Piper going over cleanly because, of course, the fans don't want to see the heel go over in a blow-off match for some reason. So they ended up with a disqualification finish, and the boxing match itself was pretty disappointing. I mean, I mean, there wasn't much offense, and even when there was offense, it wasn't really that good. So, so far, WrestleMania, WrestleMania 2 is a little disappointing to me. So now we move on to the Rosemont Horizon portion of the show. And that show kicked off. That show. Horizon portion of the show. And that show kicked off. And that show kicked off with the fabulous Moolah defending her women's championship against Velvet McIntyre. Okay, all I gotta say is that. Once again, WrestleMania 2 gives up a, a disappointing performance with this women's title match. I mean, it was barely under a minute, and uh, honestly, there's not much you can say about that match. It was, Mula gets the win over over a, a miss by McIntyre, and that's pretty much it. That's yeah, that's that's the, there's not, the, I mean, there's there's not much else you can say. There's not much else you can say about that, and um. Anyway, um, the next matchup, the next matchup on the card was Corporal Kirshner taking on Nikolai Volkov in a flag match. Kirshner gets the win, thus, thus getting the opportunity to wave the country of the U.S. of A. Again, I think this match could have been better, but it didn't. And again, 
disappointing stuff. Now we move on. The next matchup was the NFL WWF Battle Royal that pitted um, a lot of the NFL stars taking on the wrestling stars of the WWF. Um, okay, there's a lot of football stars in this one. Probably a little more than they deserved, but anyway, it was one of those matches where where they wanted just to get Andre over as a monster face within his dwindling career, and it did his job. And I did like the little mini push by the Hart Foundation, who makes their WrestleMania debut here. Now I I heard that that Rick, I heard that Bret Hart it was supposed to be Bret Hart and Ricky Steamboat here on WrestleMania 2, which to me would have been a hell of a lot better than what Bret Hart got, but but they did have an awesome match at the Boston Garden like a couple weeks prior, and you can check that out on YouTube or you can check it out on Bret Hart's DVD if you have it. But uh, anyway. And of course, we all remember the appearance of the refrigerator Rick Perry, who made his appearance in the, in the Battle Royal, got eliminated by Big John Studd, who did get his revenge by eliminating Studd. Now, I don't think anything happened after that, so I don't see what, what was the point of all that. But, the Battle Royal, it was what it was, and it got Andre over. And, the next matchup was the WWF Tag Team Championship match between the Dream Team, Greg Valentine and Brutus, uh, Brutus Beefcake, taking on the British Bulldogs. Now, finally, this was the matchup a lot of people were waiting for, and they definitely delivered. This matchup definitely was one of the better matches of the entire night, and it's a shame we waited this long for it to, for it to happen. The match itself was great. Of course, we all know the caliber of talent Greg Valentine is, and of course, Brutus, um, of course, Brutus Beefcake was barely finding his niche, and uh, of course, we all know a, what great caliber tag team that the British Bulldogs were, and to me, the matchup didn't disappoint, and it was one of the better matches of the night, and I fairly enjoyed it. And of course, we all felt great when the British Bulldogs finally won the tag team belts, thus cementing their legacy as one of the greatest tag teams arguably the greatest tag team of all time. Okay, so now we move on to the LA Sports Arena portion of WrestleMania 2. And that show got us going with Hercules Hernandez taking on Ricky Steamboat. Now Ricky Steamboat, once again, I mean he's he's barely finding his niche and he's getting better in the WWE style. And um, Hercules was a newcomer, so he was pretty green in this one, so Ricky Steamboat had to help him out in some spots. But it was a pretty energetic opener, and I I, pretty, I really liked it a lot. Of course, Ricky Steamboat would have not only a better match, but one of the greatest, most memorable matches in WrestleMania history, and arguably WWE history, and we'll get to that later. Now then, the next matchup on the card was... Uncle Elmer taking on adorable Adrian Adonis. Just when we thought that the disappointing matches would stop, it didn't. Of course, we all know Uncle Elmer couldn't really carry couldn't carry a match if it couldn't carry a wrestling match if it was given to him on a bucket. And of course, and of course, Adrian Adrian Adonis was one of those wrestlers that was good when he started out, but then when he gained weight and got the gay gimmick, got that homosexual gimmick, it kind of deteriorated. And it showed and it showed in this match and there's not much as not, not much to say except it was a disappointment. Moving on. The next matchup was a tag team match that had the Funk brothers, Dory Jr. and Terry Funk, or Haas Funk as Dory Jr. was called, taking on the team of Tito Santana and the Junkyard Dog. This matchup was surprisingly good, with uh, Terry Funk taking a table bump, one of the first, that, one of the first, but not the last table bump we'll see in WWE history. Now then, the matchup itself was pretty energetic. I liked it. I mean, both all four guys gave gave us a good show, and it was definitely a good way to set us up for the main event. And here we go, the main event of WrestleMania 2 fitted a cage match between. Hulk Hogan and King Kong Bundy for the WWF Championship. Now I I like I kind of like the build up to this one. Uh, King Kong Bundy had uh, 
crushed Hulk Hogan's ribs on an episode of Saturday Night's Main Event. So his WW so Hogan's WWF Championship reign was put in jeopardy, and a lot of people were wondering whether or not that Hogan was going to survive or Hogan was going to walk out the champion. So the build-up was there. The crowd level was there, in my opinion, and uh, the match itself was it was pretty good. But the story and the crowd level kind of overshadowed that, kind of made up for that, and it ended up printing a memorable moment. And Hogan, of course, being the hero, walks out to steal the champion. Um, my overall analysis of WrestleMania 2, it was pretty much, it was pretty much average, you know, it was pretty much average, just like the one at WrestleMania 1, only the difference is that WrestleMania 1, of course, was the precursor, it was the precursor to what we see today, and it had a lot of historical significance, but since this was the second show, I, I can't, I can't really let it off that easy, I mean, I mean, other than the t tag team title match, and I guess the the funk, the funk and the funks and Santana and JYD match, I guess I don't know. And the anticipation and the build up of the cage match, I mean, the card was pretty much disappointing. I think one of the reasons because of that was because it was held in three different venues, so one venue only got four matches live, and then they had to see the other ones on a screen or something. And same thing with the other venues. And for obvious reasons, of course, Vince never tried this three-venue thing again, and we never saw it again. Thank goodness for that. But, um, but yeah, that's there's not much else to say except WrestleMania 2 was pretty disappointing, and it would get better, and there will be better WrestleManias to come. Okay, that'll do it for this edition of WWE Flashback. Thank you for joining me. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at jjmwwe89, and join me next time as we will go over WrestleManias 3 and 4. And until next time, thank you for watching. Take care, y'all.